Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for another webcast in our Civic Education Series. This project is a joint venture involving the Congressional Youth Leadership Council, the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress, and the Lou Fry Institute at the University of Central Florida. My name is John Cool, and I'm going to be moderating today's conversation with two former members of Congress. We will focus on the role of the new media in the current political environment. Specifically, we'll explore how technological developments such as social media blogs, the plethora of 24-hour news stations, have changed our political discourse. To help us explore this subject, we are pleased to be joined by Congressman Mike Ferguson of New Jersey, a Republican, and Congressman Larry LaRocco, a Democrat from Idaho. They will field questions from a live studio audience comprised of high school students throughout the country who are here in Washington as part of the National Young Leaders Conference. Before we open the floor to, to questions, why don't we give each of our panelists a chance to introduce themselves. Congressman Ferguson, we'll, we'll start with you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Ferguson. I served for eight years representing the 7th Congressional District of New Jersey. Um, I uh, just retired about 18 months ago and I served on the Energy and Commerce Committee where I spent a lot of time working on health care issues, uh, energy issues, telecommunications and technology issues um, and uh, it was a wonderful experience and I'm delighted to be with you here today. Thanks. Congressman? Thanks John. Uh, my name is Larry LaRocco. I served in the uh, House of Representatives from 1991 to 1995 from the 1st District of Idaho and uh, most recently I ran for the United States Senate in Idaho in 2008, unfortunately, not successfully. I served on the Banking uh, and Interior Committees and uh, in my most recent campaign I used a lot of the uh, uh, social media and, and uh, communication tools you mentioned and it was a lot different in 2008 than it was in 1990 and, and even during a campaign I ran in 1982. So I look forward to the questions today. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, we're going to dive in right now. It seems like the news never stops these days. We have 24-hour news networks. Um, so why don't we take our first question from the audience. Um, hello. My name is uh, William Hanna. I'm from New York City, New Jersey. Um, my question is, with so many limitless sources of information, how do you know that us Americans are receiving the correct information? Mm, good question. It's a great question, and uh, part of your question you have to, we have to define our terms, right? The right information or the correct information. I think one of the challenges we have with such a stratified news media today, there are so many different channels on TV, there are so many different websites that you can um, get your information from. Um, they've tended to, uh, people have tended to look at the websites or the channels on cable that um, are sort of more to their liking in terms of more matching up with their own ideas and opinions and political ideology. So you tend to hear from a lot of folks who agree with you, because uh, we tend to, as human beings, I guess, gravitate toward uh, those channels, those sources, which we feel more in common with. Um, and perhaps one of the problems with that is we hear less and less of a different viewpoint, maybe a viewpoint which uh, you know, is different from our own. So it's, it's difficult. And um, I think the challenge for uh, those who are really looking for the correct information or the accurate information, as your question suggests, suggests is making sure that we're really looking at a diversity of websites for our news, or diver a diversity of uh, news channels, uh, to make sure we hear different sides. That's something I enjoy doing, actually, sometimes is looking at channels or websites which I know I might not disagree with, I might not agree with, but to see if I can, I can pick apart their arguments or, or pick apart the information to be, have a critical eye and ear uh, when we're gathering that news. Congressman, is, it, uh, is the onus on the news consumer to decide what's good and what's not? Well, it is in a way, uh, but we do have a tendency, as Mike mentioned, just to go to the news source that we tend to agree with instead of watching uh, Glenn Beck and Rachel Maddow uh, in a given evening and then trying to figure it all out. We tend to go to one or the other and, and stay tuned to something that's more philosophically attuned. I think the, the problem is for uh, members of Congress is trying to discern what is really um, happening out in your district or in the state and what is the real feeling because we've even seen town meetings that get uh, overrun by uh, people and and uh, in the old days you'd go out to a town meeting and you expected to hear the views of people and now you don't know if things are being orchestrated so it's very difficult when you're drinking from that fire hose as a member of Congress to figure out if it's being uh, if those are true feelings or not okay mm -hmm. we'll go to our next question there, thank, thank you, you. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Rob Egan from Wichita, Kansas. My question is, do you think that the news cycle uh, that's constantly out there has a positive or negative impact on you when you run your campaigns? Hmm. I'm going to start with you this time. Well, you know, I, you start with the idea that in a free society that you can never have too much information, but I think it, it, it's having a bit of a negative impact, quite frankly, that uh, uh, there's this feed the beast type of mentality where these stations have to be fed all of this news and, and uh, they need to be on the air with things all the time to feed to because they're for-profit organizations, they have advertisers and so forth. And sometimes I think that uh, um, they're not doing the, the, the real, true, in-depth journalism that we need in a democratic society. And I think that there's too much emotion right now that, that's going on um, uh, outside of the mainstream press. I would say it's, an, I agree with Larry, it's an enormous challenge when you run a campaign because what you really want to do in a campaign is control the message, right? You want to make sure that the message you're trying to project is being heard by the voters and the voters that you want to be communicating with. So on the one hand, you know, if as we say that people are watching the channels that they want to watch and t typically agree with, you can direct your message, you can target your message perhaps a little bit more effectively. So in that sense, it helps on a campaign because you could buy more of Fox News or more of CNN or more of MSNBC, depending on which audience you're trying to reach. But the flip side is that these, this 24-hour these 24 24 news cycle um, it's, it, it's a beast that needs to be fed. They need more information, they need guests on there, they need something to talk about all the time. So frequently, um, as, as we were saying, uh, they're just looking for any information out there and they report it sometimes as news when it might really might not be newsworthy at all or it might not even be accurate. Um, anybody can say anything they want on a blog, right? Anyone can start a blog anytime they want and if a, if a certain piece of information ends up on a blog, uh, some folks will read that as uh, a piece of journalism, you know, well-researched and factual journalism, when in fact it may simply be someone's opinion. And, but because the 24-hour the news cycle is a beast that needs to be fed, sometimes something will make its way from a blog into an actual news article or news uh, item on a, on, a, on a TV station or on a, on a uh, mainstream news site, which may not have any factual basis whatsoever. So it's, it makes it extremely difficult to control a message and it makes it extremely difficult to correct information which actually may not be accurate. So from that standpoint, it makes it very, very difficult to campaign. And I just want to add, if I hear anything more about Lindsay Lohan, I'm going to go nuts. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of that story. I think they've got to move on. So. All right, I'll take the next question. Hi, my name is Lacey Jones. I am from Kelso, Washington, uh, Washington State. Um, my question for you guys is, is it frustrating having a 24-hour press around and not be necessarily being able to correct the news at all those hours yourselves? So we got into this a minute ago with everyone racing to get a story first. Sometimes they do make mistakes. How do you correct things that are, that are wrong? It's, it's very, very difficult. Um, first of all, I think it's in the human nature of a reporter or a journalist. If they've reported on something, if they've said it, if they've put it out there as factual uh, and it is wrong, uh, human nature sometimes make it, makes it difficult for them to admit that they made a mistake. So you really need to work very, very hard uh, and really prove your point to them and to their editor, usually, or their producer, above and beyond what you'd think the, uh, the burden of proof ought, ought to be. Uh, so that makes it very, very difficult, just human nature. Now that's, that's not uh, unique to a 24-hour news cycle. Or I mean, That was true years ago with newspaper reporting, just as it's true today with other types of reporting. Um, but it is, it's, what makes it much more difficult today is that news travels so fast today. If something's up on a blog, it can be picked up by a news cycle. I mean, there used to be a, um, a news cycle where you know, something that happened one day would re be reported the next day. Well, today, something could happen one moment and be all over the world within minutes. Um, so, uh, you know, that makes it very, very challenging. If there is, you know, incorrect information, you used to have a day to correct that information if you knew a reporter or a journalist was working on that story. Today, you don't have that kind of time. There's not that buffer for thoughtful reflection to educate someone who may have a story wrong. That makes it really, really challenging. 
One of the uh, things that's interesting about today's news cycle is that the bloggers, and, and I give them a lot of credit, are doing the in-depth research that others can't because they have such tight deadlines and restricted budgets. So the bloggers will be there and then they will feed the mainstream press. But if they are ideologically driven or politically driven and they want to uh, do a hatchet job on somebody and then the mainstream press accepts it and it gets into that cycle, then it's like, how can you put this toothpaste back in the, in the tube because it's out there. So if they're saying something about you for, in, a, uh, in a political campaign and it's out there, then it becomes reality and you're just chasing your tail and you can't really put it down. So I give the bloggers credit on uh, one hand, but it's the responsibility of the mainstream uh, press if they're going to use it to, to make sure that it's accurate. So they have to go back and, and check it. Um, I was thinking today that I think in the 2002 campaign, um, campaigns used fax uh, or blast faxes as, as a way that was pretty you know, high tech where they sent out faxes to everybody. That was eight years ago. And you think about where you were eight years ago and how fast we've moved. That's like a relic. Uh, of the past, and now things are moving very quickly with tweeters and, and everything uh, else. And, and it makes the tempo move quicker in the campaign as well. Yeah. All right, thank you. Let's go to the last question for this part. Hello, I'm Darren Siano Jr. from New Orleans, Louisiana. My question is, does the 24-hour news cycle present a significant value to our nationwide viewers? Well, uh, the 24-hour news cycle is on our mind today, and I think it's worth discussing. And, and um, I think it's got value in, in, in uh, a free society. I think it's got value in projecting our country around the world. Um, and we're getting our news from uh, everywhere. And, and um, um, you know, it, it just think how it, it changes our life. And, and you can get up in the morning, and, and I'm from Idaho, and here I am in Washington, D.C., and the first thing I did after I ran this morning is I, I read the Idaho Statesman online, and then I read the Washington Post, and you can read anything else, and I read Bloomberg. And that's, uh, all that was done before 9 o'clock this morning, and uh, that's, it's efficient, it's helpful, and uh, it just means we're more productive. But uh, it also can be kind of stressful as well. Um, it's tough to get away anymore from all of this and, and have anything that's relaxing. It, it, there's no more just sort of sitting around and feeling that, that newspaper and getting the ink on your fingers and having a donut and reading, read, uh, drinking your coffee. It's just this constant barrage. In a way, it's good, but it has to be managed. I completely agree, and I would um, add that um, it's, uh, it's like any other very powerful tool. Okay, you think of a power drill or an electric saw, right? Um, it's a very powerful tool. It can do great good if it's used in the right way, right? But it can also do great damage if it's used in the incorrect way. And the 24-hour news cycle, the internet, um, these new technologies and new developments with our media uh, can be a great force for good. I mean, it's I think it's a very good thing if it means the, um, uh, the, the people of our country are more educated, they have more information, they can hold their elected officials more accountable than they could in the past, uh, they, can, they can become involved uh, more easily. Um, it, it, there are many good things that can come from these new technologies or the, as we talk about the 24-hour news cycle. It's just my belief, and, and I think this is the gist of what we're both saying, is um, it need, we, we need to make sure we use it as a, as a tool for good. And that means um, you know, being a, 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 a discerning listener, a discerning uh, 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 consumer of this information. It means knowing that not everything you read on the internet is factual, right? There's a lot that can make it on there that's not true. Um, it means that not everything that you hear on TV is true, right? Or, or even important or relevant. We're talking about some, you know, sort of silly news stories that, you know, really are not relevant to all of our lives, but are sort of entertainment value for some folks. Um, it's just very, very important to make sure that we use these very powerful tools in a way that's that's good and not allow them to be abused or not allow ourselves to be taken advantage of by folks who are putting information out there that may not have been checked or double checked. You know, a good example of this, just to fill in for a second here, is this, this recent controversy over the 
uh, minister, if you will, in Florida that had a following of 50 people and he was going to burn the Koran. This became a worldwide story involving the President of the United States. And, and yeah, it was, wasn't it, Mike? I mean, and, and, and the, the Secretary of State, General Petraeus, had to get involved uh, to protect our, our troops. Um, in the old days, and not too long ago, I mean, old days meaning five years ago, ten years ago, this story would have never surfaced. Right. It would have been a local surface, it would have been a local protest, but it became a worldwide protest, and it was going to represent the values of the United States overseas, where people see this and then they characterize us. In the old days, they, they saw the, the, the old cowboy and Indians movies and they thought that we were all just living in the Wild West and that's what they thought of Americans, or they saw, you know, Hollywood portrayed us. Now this new cycle is portraying us, and it can, can be negative, can be dangerous, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, great. Thank you for the question. Uh, next, we want to dive into the tools of the new media. You know, every elected official has a website or, or campaign website. There's members of Congress tweeting from the State of the Union. If you're running for office, anything you say could end up on YouTube. How, how has that changed things? So why don't we start off with our first question on that subtopic. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Ben Shmulevsky, and I'm from Portland, Oregon. And I was wondering, how does the rise in social, the, po the rise of popularity in social networking sites such as Facebook and Twitter help gain a greater amount of support from younger voters, such as between the ages of 18 and 25? Were either of you involved involved with Facebook for your campaigns? You were. I was, yeah. And uh, how did, was it helpful getting young people engaged? It was very helpful. I mean, it's, it's helpful for scheduling events. It's helpful for fundraising. Uh, it's helpful for messaging. It's helpful for uh, sort of uh, connecting with people. It's helpful for getting out the vote and, and uh, uh, putting out a message. It's putting uh, helpful for putting out fires. As a matter of fact, in, in 2008, I, uh, I used that, and my opponent didn't. And the media picked up on it and said, I was a high-tech, modern, <laughs> think of me being modern, you know, <laughs> and uh, a candidate. And my kids thought that was pretty cool and because uh, they never thought of me being high-tech and modern. But I used that. I actually did uh, uh, live um, on uh, online uh, news conferences and answered questions online. Uh, one time I, I had an avatar and, and uh, went on. And, and <laughs> so you're laughing. But uh, uh, it was a... I was trying to connect with people as they received their messages. In other words, it, um, you all, the, the young people of this country, are receiving their messages in a way, and, and you had to reach them. And I tried my best to reach you on, on your terms, if you will. Congressman Perkins, do you think Facebook is important? It is. It's very important because the, the age group that you cite, the 18 to 24-year-old uh, American young man, young woman, is typically the least engaged with our politics and with uh, the public square. Um, that may be for lots of different reasons, but the reality is there's, it's always a challenge for public officials and um, uh, campaigners to reach those voters, to, to reach them, to talk to them, communicate with them about issues that, you know, that the uh, uh, candidate feels are important, to solicit feedback from those voters to find out what is important to those voters, to those young people. Um, and it's also very a, a great challenge to motivate them to go out and vote, because that's typically the, the um, age group that votes in the lowest percentages. Um, so th I think it's, it's a crucial tool. And anyone who's not using uh, social media today, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or, the, or other um, uh, social media, to try and reach those voters is making a big mistake. Um, and frankly, it's, it's, uh, it's missing an opportunity in our civics, because what we should really want is for as many people to be involved uh, in our civic life as possible, and that includes 18 to 24-year-olds too. Yeah, we'll have to see how these generations go, because there's going to be a new generation of communications at some point, because things are d developed so quickly in our country, and the politicians that are able to keep up with that and be one step ahead of their opponents or their competition are probably going to be successful. I remember Howard Dean, and he pioneered raising money on the internet. And that was a new thing. And then Obama uh, came uh, behind him, raising a lot of money, democratizing politics in a way by receiving small contributions. Now Rand Paul, the Tea Party people are doing the same thing. Um, so uh, there'll be a new generation. And if, if you have somebody now, and in managing a campaign, I used to say, I need somebody under 30 that's handling my communications because um, 
uh, your generation are the one that understand it and you're hip, <laughs> use an old term, <laughs> you understand it and uh, you need to help us. Now, the, the, I'll just close by on this one point by saying something is that the, the bloggers, sometimes when people go on blogs and, and uh, they write, not the bloggers, but when you comment, it's not good for a candidate to read what's said about him because <laughs> it's, it's a pretty, things get pretty nasty as well. Uh, yeah. uh, comedy and politeness uh, are left at the, uh, yeah. uh, at the, the at outside the room. And uh, anonymity um, creates a lot of uh, that meanness, I think, because there's no, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, the responsibility or accountability. Right. Yeah, thanks. Next question. Hello, I'm Priscilla Russo and I'm from Long Island, New York. My question is, do you feel pressured by the younger generation to use social networking sites in order to have political success? We got into this a little bit. Yeah. Sarah Palin, for example, has made a lot of news using Facebook. Sure. I, I think there is. I think there's certainly, um, I don't know if you want to call it pressure or uh, uh, if you want to survive, I think, as a candidate, as a public official, certainly as a member of Congress today, um, that's one of the ways to do it. I mean, in a, a member of Congress has six, seven hundred thousand, sometimes more, constituents. It's impossible to stay in touch with all of those folks on a personal basis. But social media, like Facebook, um, allows a little bit more personal interaction. Uh, and Twitter allows a little bit more of that personal interaction. Can get you into trouble, though. Because uh, what we found, we, we you know you, you you see stories about someone who's who's tweeting uh, on their BlackBerry uh, during the State of the Union address, for instance. Um, yeah. You know that person ought to probably ought to be listening to the president at that moment <laughs> and not sending a message uh, out on out on the internet, right? Uh, you know there'll be time to do that afterwards. But again, that's a it's a perfect example of the new technology. You know if someone is doing something like that, um, you know it's all of a sudden all over the world in in moments. Uh, the fact that they weren't paying attention to the president during the State of the Union address. So it certainly is, I think, um, it, it's, a, it's a challenge for candidates to, to be able to do that and for public officials in terms of staying in touch with their constituents. But you have to make sure that you use these technologies well and uh, because you can get caught with your hand in the cookie jar sometimes. Well, let me ask you a, a practical question. So you, ha you said you used Facebook in your campaign. Yeah. So were you the one sitting there accepting friend requests or, or tweeting, or did you, was that something that a staff member does? Well, I always did my own uh, blogging and, and live blogging, and, and um, I prided myself in doing that. And um, I, I think that in today's political world, though, that some politicians will set it up that they have the Facebook, and when the answers come out or the, the messages come out, that it's not really him or her that's doing it. And so then you have a proxy, and you're not, I think that's sort of violating the intent of, of, the, uh, of these new social media, that, that it's personal. So it gets to be, a, it could be a, a bit fake as well. Um, I was gonna add, though, uh, John, that uh, what we're doing here is we're, we're shortening everything, we're making it more concise, uh, as we know, you can only have so many characters on a tweet. Um, so if we're shortening everything, um, that bothers me because I think we're in a period of, of sort of rampant uh, anti-intellectualism in the United States on our political messages. So if we're shortening things, then we'll have a tendency in order to persuade people that the messages become more emotional, less intellectual, less in-depth, and sometimes you, uh, people take complex issues and then they boil them down to a few words. And that can be very dangerous for a co uh, country because we may start using stereotypes, um, the trigger words, emotional uh, words. Uh, it may b be borderline racist or whatever. So I think we have to be careful about this and where this is all heading. Um, and again, uh, we, we can't fight it, but uh, uh, now the young people who have a lower percentage of voting um, historically in this country, if a politician can increase the percentage of voting of that um, part of the population, those are found votes. So the question is, are, do we feel pressure? I think it would be, uh, if we can increase the vote uh, of that demographic and that segment of the population, your demographic, that youth, uh, that would probably come our way and it would be what we would call you know, finding new voters. So.
Right. Thank you for the question. We'll move on now to our last part of the discussion, which is opinions and commentary. I mean, there's whole networks now. We've got Fox on the, the right and MSNBC on the left, CNN somewhere in the middle, and you know, tons and tons of talking heads from all kinds of viewpoints. Um, let's dive into that. Uh, we'll take our first question on that. Um, hello. Oh. I'm Rachel Daniel from Agora Hills, California, and I was wondering, do you worry that people's biases and commentaries will become facts rather than opinions? Sure, and that's, uh, we touched on it a little bit, but that's, that's exactly what can happen with all these new technologies, and that's one of the dangers. When we talk about new technology, uh, new communications, the internet, the 24-hour news cycle, that's one of the challenges of this very, very powerful tool that has great capacity for good. Uh, in terms of educating us and giving us information. One of the downsides, or if that very powerful tool is not used in the right way, uh, so-called facts become facts all of a sudden. And that's a real challenge, uh, and it's very, very difficult. Um, you know, one of the challenges, too, of, of the new technology is uh, these um, flip cameras, you know, the, a, a, a video camera that's no bigger than the size of your palm. Uh, you know, we, we've seen this uh, where someone can walk up to someone and flip, flip on a video and start uh, 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 videoing and uh, recording uh, 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 moving picture of a, uh, uh, of a public official or anyone really and within moments that can be on the internet and that can be uh, sent around the world um, very very quickly uh, so uh, that's a real challenge uh, for public officials because who knows who's editing that right who knows if the complete uh, picture is being uh, given who knows if the complete story is being told um, that's a real challenge, and it's, it goes along the lines with you can, you can type in uh, your opinion about something that can become fact. You can also put a video up on the Internet um, and send it around to folks. It may not capture the whole story as well, so it's a, it's a real communications challenge for public officials. Yeah, I'd just comment briefly. I, um, I think we need to stop and think of, about how important objective journalism is to us in this country, where you have somebody who goes out and just tells the story. And um, uh, we don't have that so much anymore with the uh, social networking because uh, it tends to be more opinionated. And um, so if that is taken as fact, then, then we're in trouble because somebody has a point of view. Um, so uh, people say that the, the mainstream press, the newspapers are in a downward spiral more or less a death spiral. But they're, they've been the ones who have had the objective journalists who can go out and get the story and really dig and do it for all the right reasons and not have any ties to anybody and, and have very high standards and, um, and, and high ethics and morals. And it, it is an honorable profession and I hope that we can keep that because we need to have objectivity in the news that we're all digesting and consuming. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, because of time, that's going to be our last question. So for closing thoughts, new technology, 24-hour news cycles, are things better now or worse? Oh, I think you could make an argument that they're better and worse. But, um, you know, to the extent that these tools, these very powerful tools, are used for good, that they're used to engage people in our civic life, that they're used to gather information, factual information, if they're, if they're used in a way with, with honesty and integrity, um, I think they can be a very, very powerful force for good uh, in our civic life. But just because they are so powerful, they can also be very negative if they're not used in the right way. And that's why, at the end of the day, it really comes back to our own personal integrity, right? It really comes back to how honest we are with one another. Uh, and if we are truly uh, looking out for making sure that um, information is accurate and honest and trustworthy, um, it's no different from anything else in our lives. And you're certainly learning that as you're, as you're growing older. Uh, Congressman, in 30 seconds, are we better off or worse off now? Well, I'd say uh, we're better off because we're, it's more transparent, it's more honest, we, we know what's going on. Uh, as Mike has said, and I agree with him, we have to watch it. Um, sometimes I think we should think about the on-off button, uh, just like the old days, and, and uh, uh, there is a button, we can get away from it. Uh, I'd like to see us have more social, uh, social interaction, personal interaction, mm -hmm. uh, rather than just rely on technology. Uh, I think we're missing a lot if we're not talking to one another. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, we learn a lot from one another, and uh, uh, so I think it's a positive. All right, great. Thank yeah. you both. 
Um, that, unfortunately, is all the time we have today. Thank you very much for tuning in. I also want to thank our two panelists for sharing their time and expertise with us, Congressman Ferguson and Congressman LaRocco. Thank you both very much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Also, thanks to our studio audience from the National Young Leaders Conference. I hope you all have enjoyed uh, your time here in the conversation. And we hope you will join us again uh, next month when we present a bipartisan panel of former members of Congress focusing on the U.S. Senate and its intricate rules and procedures. This this webcast, the one you're watching now, will be archived uh, on the websites of the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress at usafmc.org, the Lou Fry Institute at loufry.org, and on CYLC's website, cylc.org. Thank you all for joining us.